Well, hello everyone. This is John Byrne back with our Center Court MBA Festival. Our last panel for today is a really great panel. Uh, we're going to talk about careers uh, and what the MBA can do for you uh, long term professionally. And we have three great schools and three great representatives from those schools. Abby Scott, uh, there she is. Uh, Looks like you have a beautiful office, maybe. Uh, maybe that's a fake background. Maybe it's a real background. We'll know. A dining room. <laughs> there you go. Oh, a dining room. All right. Abby is assistant dean of MBA career management and uh, corporate partnerships at uh, UC Berkeley High School of Business, which is just a stone's throw away from me. If I, if I hop in my car in San Rafael, I can be at Abbey School in 20, 25 minutes tops. Um, where we have Dimitri Wands, who is much further away from me at the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business. Dimitri is the Career Services Coordinator. Uh, he was married in Sonoma though, and he hopes to visit back uh, this October. We uh, will welcome him back to California. And then we have Carly Eskew, and Carly um, actually has a sister who lives in San Diego. So there's a California connection every way around, right? And, and Carly is Director of Graduate Business Career Services at the University of Florida. Welcome all. So it's been a crazy year. Um, and I imagine that uh, the pandemic has had some impact on career outcomes uh, for the class just graduated. I know in many cases, things are really picking up very quickly in the United States. Uh, many economists are predicting a very robust recovery uh, and a long standing one. I wonder how, you know, how does your latest class fare in the marketplace? Um, are you happy with what you've seen so far? I know the employment reports won't be out until the fall, so we won't have a full accounting. But uh, Abby, tell me how your students have done. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, there's a good California vibe, it sounds like, today. So we'll try to keep that going. Um, honestly, take a deep breath. This is going to be a lot of fun, and hopefully you'll get a lot of great information today. So class of 2021. Um, it's a heck of a lot better than it was last year at this time. If you think about last year at this time, things were really uncertain. And so I'd say internships in particular um, felt, it, it sort of felt like everything blew up and, and students who had accepted internships earlier um, had to pivot to this notion of a virtual internship. Students who were in final rounds with companies, um, you know, had interviews disappear. Um, and had to, in some cases, really quickly pivot. So fast forward a year later, things seem much more stable. Um, we have seen the job market pick up significantly. In fact, we're even um, feeling like it's ahead of where we were two years ago at this time. Um, and I think that's just because there's a lot of hope and optimism. Uh, and I think there are a lot of companies that have um, new business models that have had to grow quickly and they're looking for MBA talent to help with some of these big strategic challenges that they face. So um, in many ways, it's, it's a good time to be coming out of business school. It still is a tough market. I don't wanna pretend that um, our students aren't working really hard, but it sure feels a lot better than it did a year ago. Glad to hear that. Carly, how's it look at your school? Yeah, I'll echo kind of what Abby had said this time last year, there was a lot of fear in terms of, you know, what might happen and regret about what had already happened, but, you know, some lumps in throats about what was to be. Um, we ended up weathering uh, COVID pretty well last year, and, and that's really a testament to our students' flexibility outside of some, you know, initial more narrow targets, I think. Um, I, I think, John, you're likely to see good news coming out of Florida for our at grad figures this year. So echoing kind of what Abby had said, um, you know, an even a better place, I think, this year than, than last year. Um, interns, we're, we're seeing a lot of late activity from 
employers actually coming after interns that we no longer have. <laughs> and so that's, you know, that's a really good feeling. And, you know, in a sense, I want to be uh, responsive to employers who are bringing us opportunities. But similar to what Abby had said, you know, our, our class has done really, really well this year. The class of 21 was really special uh, for us in a lot of ways. You know, they're that kind of in-between class who had the face-to-face -face first year and have it had to pivot and sort of knew that difference, right, compared to their face-to-face -face first year and their virtual second year. And so I think they'll, the class of 21 will be special for all of our uh, groups. And, and I think they ended the, the year really well. That's terrific. And I just want to point out, we have a really good representation uh, uh, for the U.S. because we have the South, we have the West, and we have the Midwest here. And Dimitri, what's it look like at Ross? Like Abby and Carly said, things are looking so much better than last year. Uh, there is, dis despite the pandemic just raging in parts of the world and in India, and my heart goes out to, to anybody that is in a country that's still being severely affected. Um, but, but yeah, we're seeing a much more positive picture here in the United States and here with Ross students with regard to internships and full time. Uh, so my specific areas are technology, entrepreneurship, and social impact. And tech, uh, it, you know, the picture has been pretty remarkable, uh, the growth that tech firms have experienced over the last year. And we've seen that translate into demand for MBA talent as well. Um, so I, I think we're in a much better position. Um, and a lot of the areas our students are in, where students are interested in, there's tremendous growth and opportunity. So I think, yeah, we're in a, a very good spot this year. And I would think we're going to see some unleashing of pent up demand. You know, when the pandemic occurred, uh, the tendency for a lot of companies was to hunker down and to put things on hold. To the extent that that occurred, you're going to have, you know, your natural growth in demand as a result of a rise in the economy, but you're also going to have some pent up demand from companies that actually needed uh, more talent and held off because of the uncertainty caused by the pandemic. And no matter what the case is, everyone knows that in a tough market, higher education is something that pays off. And so uh, whether you're in a good market, you're in a bad market, or a medium market, uh, having higher education uh, puts you in a better place. All the research shows you're going to make more money, you're more likely to be employed than unemployed, uh, and you're more likely to have a more fulfilled uh, and you know, aspiring career where, you know, your personal development and your personal growth is an important part of just being happy in what you do. Um, what's your take on um, trends in terms of industries that are doing the hiring? Um, I'm imagining, obviously, the three big ones, consulting, finance, and tech, uh, are pretty solid. I'm wondering if you're seeing new trends in new industries. You know, uh, Dimitri, you mentioned social impact and more people are going and getting uh, MBAs and going into that field. Healthcare seems to be growing in importance, both uh, among the interest of students as well as uh, the demands of that industry. Abby, you see any trends emerging uh, through all the clutter and the uncertainty? Yeah, well, you hit on a few, John. Um, and I guess I would think a little bit less about industry trends because we're seeing, you know, with a few exceptions, well, even, even some of the industries that really locked up, um, like hospitality um, and real estate was really tough last year too. Those are even, of course, starting to hire again. Um, but what I'm thinking about um, in response to your question are more the skill sets that companies have identified, I think, as a result of the pandemic and having to shift their workforce, in some cases, shift their business model. We're just hearing a lot more um, from companies about this, some new, newer skill sets that we didn't hear mentioned as frequently before. And I think these apply to many different industries. So I'm going to answer with that lens in mind. So things like comfort with ambiguity. Um, is something that's just really rising to the top um, and companies really want students to tell stories and demonstrate that they've, that they've been in that environment. We all have for the last year. So being able to describe how that would be um, something they could bring to a, a growth company uh, is one thing. Um, you know, of course, flexibility is another um, that's related to that. Um, so I guess, 
you know, as I look at job descriptions, which by the way, all of you should, should be doing this right now. It's really fun to look, um, just do a search out there on MBA level job descriptions and look at some of the skill sets that they're looking for. I wonder if you'll notice too, that they've evolved a little bit um, to, to highlight some of these sort of softer skills that have become increasingly important. Dimitri, you have a take on any uh, trends that you're seeing? Yeah, I think you mentioned a few. We're certainly seeing uh, an increase in interest in healthcare. Uh, education, I think, is another interesting area. And then within tech, I think a, a few really interesting trends. So one is fintech. Ross has, has spun up a new fintech initiative, and we're seeing uh, just a ton of interest in that intersection of financial services and technology. We're seeing it more broadly as well, but certainly among our MBA students. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, I think too, for a while, there was a lot of interest in tech and product marketing and product management. And as I've been in this position for the last four years, I've seen that interest diversify. Uh, in part as tech has eaten more of the world, but in part as organizations have realized that their MBAs can add a lot of value to different parts of the organization. So seeing it in sales or post sales, so customer success. Um, so I think some exciting trends there. And then on the social impact front, um, instead of it being, hey, I'm going to go work for a nonprofit or a foundation, I think there's this trend now in business school uh, and post-MBA jobs of it, social impact being embedded into more traditional sounding jobs and roles. Uh, so whether that's consulting or investment banking uh, with the increased attention to ESG concerns, environmental, social, and governance concerns. Uh, so I think that's a really exciting trend that we're seeing uh, social impact less of something, hey, this is less traditional, here's what you go do if you're interested in social impact, and much more now thinking about how you integrate that into traditional functions and traditional companies and industries. And I'm imagining that the uh, new uh, corporate focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion is going to result in a number of jobs in that area as well, opening up uh, to, to MBAs. Uh, Carly, what do you see in Florida? So, you know, similar, and I won't repeat kind of what Abby and Dimitri have already um, re reviewed, but I, I think um, one thing that consumers are thinking a lot more about these days um, than we used to is supply chain. And I think that's no different um, within uh, the MBA landscape for us. Um, at Florida, at least. So we have a supply chain concentration. Um, we work with all of our graduate students ac across the college, and we also have a supply chain concentration within our information systems masters in the business school. And so I think we're just getting more and more students in admissions interviews who tell us, hey, I think this is a space I might want to work in. Whereas before it may have been a little bit more, I guess, forgotten about from uh, the up and coming MBAs. And so within both internship and, and full-time placements within this cycle, we're just seeing a little bit of an uptick in our student interest in, in supply, chain, supply chain and subsequently what some of those placements look like. We, we're having a, a supply chain employer come to our, one of our summer orientations in just a few weeks. So this is sort of top of mind for us in addition to what uh, Dimitri and Abby have mentioned. Right. Now, in hey John, can I, can I build on Dimitri's yeah. comment? I just think it was so sure. important what he said about um, that students are looking less for the job in a social impact company per se, and they're bringing that mindset to the kind of job that Carly just talked about, right? Like to that supply chain job, bringing a sustainability lens, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yes, there are more jobs probably in um, a department that's thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but MBAs from all of our schools are bringing that mindset to a job in marketing, to a job in finance. And that is the exciting shift I think that we're seeing. And that's where the opportunity is right now for MBAs. So I just wanted to flag. Yeah, good point, good point. Uh, in my earlier panel today with admissions directors, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the return of more international applicants to the US applicant pool. Uh, there are different views on this. Some uh, basically say it's a result of the new administration um, uh, and uh, maybe a little more certainty that you might be able to get a work visa. Some are saying it's a result of so many MBA programs being STEM designated. So you have another option to play in the US market if you want a job here. Uh, what, what's your sense of the opportunities for internationals 
uh, in the next coming years uh, in the US economy. Uh, Dimitri, you wanna, wanna start with that? I'm optimistic on, on opportunities for international students. Um, again, with the rise of tech, I, I think that's a really encouraging trend for international students. Um, I, I think we see a, a, more of a willingness among tech companies to sponsor international students, whether that's that's company or whether or not that's the roles that are more suitable for a STEM designation uh, or, or an MBA graduate. Uh, but I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm also optimistic uh, yeah, with the new administration and, and, and so on. I, th I, think, I think that's all cause to be optimistic. Um, yep, and Carly? What do you say? Yeah, some of, some of the same. I mean, I, I think um, domestic students are starting to um, become more and more attractive to some of the technical programs that we have within Warrington, but I'm still seeing um, a lot of energy from employers, particularly seeking out those STEM skills that Dimitri called out um, and being able to consider uh, international students. We, this year, um, had some really stellar international placements. And so anytime we're able to build on some of that momentum and bring those alumni back to talk to our current students, we feel excited and, and optimistic, especially compared to the last uh, few years. But, you know, um, I, we, we won't kid ourselves. It's a, it's a tough landscape. It's gonna remain a tough landscape. And I think any, um, you know, solid admissions that inter interview will communicate that to an international applicant but um, as long as folks kind of know what it takes and 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 know um, at least a few international students have been successful and they can use as mentors then I think they're on the right path and are better situated than even the last two years right Abby I'll just add that I think there's a lot of data out there that international students prospective students can consume um, Right, the, the companies are getting to be more and more clear, larger companies, either we have a path to sponsorship or we don't. And so um, one of our roles is to help educate students about what those kinds of companies are. Um, and then just to build on the optimism, what we are seeing is a lot of um, opportunities, a lot more opportunities in the smaller companies that don't necessarily have a policy for hiring and sponsoring or against. And so what we're doing, and I know my colleagues from other schools do as well, is talk to students about how you have those conversations, what the STEM certification opens up for you. Um, we have access to immigration attorneys that, that students can speak to about their own situation. So there's a whole network uh, and data um, behind you to support you and, um, and, and just know that, you know, in joining one of our business schools, um, you know, you become part of the part of the ecosystem that, that then feeds, you know, going forward to Carly's point about alumni. So, yeah, I, I like, you know, the, the fact that you're emphasizing the notion of tremendous support and encouragement for people uh, to find the right jobs after their MBA programs. And I always say this and I need to say it here because the audience has changed and they're new all every year. Uh, you know, business school is the one place uh, in the academy, in the university system, uh, that considers its job incomplete when you get your degree, unless you have a job. And the three people here are devoted to making sure not only that you just have a job, but that you have a job you want, uh, and that and it's a job that's going to reward you in many different ways. Um, and and so what I want to talk a little bit about now is how early the intervention is on an incoming student and how you bring that student through the journey of finding the job he or she really wants. Abby, you want to start? Sure. So it starts very early <laughs> is the punchline, um, usually over the summer. And then all of us have sort of our own flavor of careers curriculum that we run students through. So I can share just a little bit about ours. Um, the first step is really figuring out who you are and what you value. Um, what, what does meaningful, rewarding work look like to you? And that takes sometimes you know, a minute because students come in with a really clear picture. But for most of us, it takes a little bit of time to explore. So that's the first phase. Um, then we go through some of the um, story preparation. Like how do you start to tell your story about the skills that you bring from your previous role 
your college experience, your volunteer commitments, those kinds of things. How do you, how do you start to think about weaving that forward? Um, then we push you out to get you to practice lots of career conversations, we call them informational interviews. So there's a whole curriculum around that. And then of course the final phase is um, is supporting the actual applications and networking. Um, and so starts early, um, it's not a linear path um, and there's support every step of the way. You know, in talking to thousands of uh, MBA students over the years, one of the big surprises that they always have is how quickly recruiting essentially starts with info sessions when they land on campus. Uh, Dimitri, how, how early in the process do you contact uh, your admits who have indicated that they're going to come? And how do you prepare them for those that early onslaught of employers who uh, want to touch and get to know uh, your first year students? We start as early as April before. Uh, so, so soon after somebody decides they want to matriculate, we have a summer course that they take beginning in April, May, or June, depending on when they indicate they're going to come. And they, they finish that up in August. So it's going to have seven modules. Part of it are a few live interactive sessions with us where we help you walk you through some of that self-reflection, get to know your class, mm -hmm. have a one-on-one -on -one appointment with a staff coach like myself. Uh, really, we want to make sure that by the time you arrive in Ann Arbor, uh, that you've really understood what it is you're looking for long-term and short-term career goals. You've done a lot of exploration. You really understand what recruiting support you're gonna get from us um, and have already started that networking process. So that by the time companies start uh, having info sessions and whatnot in late September, early October, that you feel like you're really in good shape to, to put a good foot forward. Uh, what we like to remind people is it is a fire hose that you're drinking out of beginning in August and September. Uh, moving to a new city, classes, new friends, clubs, uh, great career. If you're just starting to think about your career, then it's just hard to give it the self-reflection you need to, which is why we start so early. Yeah, and I'm assuming, Carly, it's, it's similar uh, at Florida. It is. I was just uh, looking at my calendar when you asked the question because I think I'm speaking with five admitted students this week myself in terms of you know preparation discussions for employer sessions. Uh, Jumpstart I think is, is going on this week so we're getting a lot of activity and traction um, from that particular conference but one um, you know unique situation about Florida is given the size of our program we're kind of able to engage at any point as soon as folks are ready to onboard with us. Certainly we have some requirements and some uh, messaging that we're pushing out as some similar time frame that Dimitri mentioned, but our career team sits in on 100% of our full-time MBA admissions interviews. So you could argue that um, you're getting some of that in the admissions interview, whether or not you're asking for it. <laughs> and so um, it really starts even before um, you've been admitted in some cases, but yeah, I agree and uh, with everything that Dimitri and Abby said as well. And I, and I think in the last maybe five, 10 years, um, most schools have put on one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, for students. What does that entail? What, what do you get by having a coach to help you guide you through the career maze? Carly? Yeah, so we have a pretty um, structured process in the way that our full-time MBAs work with uh, their career coach. I coach the full-time MBA students directly and, and just to use our all majors uh, one year format uh, as an example that we started within the last couple of weeks. They have an initial discussion called a career strategy uh, discussion where they're you know basically going through here's what I liked about my previous job, here's what I think I'm looking for, and they get some feedback. Um, the next session um, is typically a, a resume overhaul. And so I'm working directly with all our full-time MBAs to really craft that narrative that Abby mentioned earlier on paper first and then subsequently within a within a mock interview setting. So we're doing mock interviews, you know, this month for some of our students who aren't going to be utilizing those skills until um, you know, mid-September in some cases. Um, but one thing that I want to call out, because I, I think our process may be somewhat similar to other schools, is we've gotten a bit smarter recently on engaging our current students as well as our alumni. And so 
I've uh, started a system of, of basically matching um, incoming students with onboarding mentors. And, and I'm sure that Ross and Haas are doing something similar, but I'm, I'm noticing a lot of enthusiasm at the very end of the semester as folks are, you know, walking across and getting, or walking across the stage and getting their diploma and that sense of urgency to get back. So I'm try, trying to capitalize on that and sending a lot of texts, you know, throughout the, the week to make sure that I'm matching incoming students with folks who are really well prepared um, to give them some early guidance, just so it's not entirely, you know, members of the staff who folks are getting their insight from. Right. Uh, at Haas, how, how does the school use uh, coaching uh, to help students? Yeah, we have, a, we have a team of coaches that we think of as the, the sort of the primary care physician. It's the first person that you meet with. Um, when you when you come, you meet with your study group and your coach, um, and your coach is there to guide you through the two years. Um, they most likely will teach your career lab curriculum, that four part curriculum that I mentioned, mm -hmm. and they they work in sort of a triaged manner. So what I mean by that is, um, if if your coach wants to refer you to another coach, or if you want to self refer to another coach, you can do that. And then of course we have the whole industry specialization because our coaches are industry agnostic and are really trained as leadership development coaches, career coaches. Um, so we have industry specialists, people who work on our teams as well as a network of young alumni who work in industry and consult back to us part-time. And then um, just like Florida and I'm sure Ross as well, we have the peer advisor model, which is a group of second year students who are part of our team, a really key part of our team. They've just been through the process. And the again, the primary care physician career coach refers or a student can self refer to get what they need. So it, it's a system. There's a whole, uh, whole bunch of support with the career coach at the center. Yeah. Dimitri, uh, you have a take on this? Yeah, we operate a similar model here at Ross. So we have our staff career coaches, such as myself. And we have different industries and functions that we're aligned with. Uh, we also have industry relations team that is in really close contact with companies. And then we have uh, 80 to 90 peer coaches who, who, again, second year students. And each one of them will lead a, a functional accountability career team, of which is a small group of first year peers, maybe five students with a second year attached to them that, that walks them through the whole uh, recruiting process for an internship. So we have the, the staff coaches, the industry relations folks, and then our, our peer coaches that provide the one-on-one -on -one as well as the, uh, the small group uh, functional accountability career teams. And, and to what extent do alumni become involved in the sort of career decisions of, of students? Do, 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 is there an active program to hook up uh, alums of your program and use the alumni network to, to uh, broaden the horizons of students or get them hooked up with other companies that they may want to work in? Carly, how do you use the alumni network? So, you know, there are half a million gators out there. <laughs> and so we, we try to, even though we have a small full-time program, we try to leverage, you know, all those gators across the globe uh, in one of two ways, you know, in an organic, you know, referral type of um, relationship handoff. And then we also do have a formal program that a current student started a couple of uh, years ago. You know, we try to follow suit with uh, corporate America. So we call it AMP in our, in our tr traditional acronym, uh, alumni mentorship program. And this, um, this is mostly designed for rising second years. So folks who are going out into their internship um, to have feedback from traditionally a full-time MBA who did a two-year um, program, give feedback on that direct, you know, presentation they're developing, how would they navigate, you know, a particular political environment within a company. But we started to broaden the lens on that a bit, and we're actually including a mix of both professional and, and full-time MBAs this year. So we're trying to cross-pollinate a little bit more than we historically would have done. And we think it's mutually beneficial for, for both programs. But, um, you know, we, we follow a lot of the uh, informational interview approach that Abby mentioned earlier as part of their onboarding and helping folks identify um, their own alumni mentors. But then we also have a, a pretty small curated program that we uh, are running over the summer and actually kicking off next week. Right. Abby, how about at Haas? So one of our 
core values at Haas, and many of you may know that we're a school that is um, very defined by our culture, and our culture is made up of our four uh, leadership principles, one of which is beyond yourself. So in addition to our alumni network, who's very aware of, of this value and lives it every day when students reach out, um, I also like to think about our part-time students, our working professional students, as a key part of the community. And in fact, using Slack as a tool, we've created a big careers community where the full-time students and the part-time students can engage because as you can imagine, many of them um, work in tech companies in particular, just because we're here so close to the heart of the technology industry um, and can serve as a connector um, that's you know just going through a similar experience as a part-time student. And then of course there's the alum community as well. And they are also actually our Slack community of alumni is just in the process of merging with our current student one. So there's lots of lots of ways to get connected uh, formally and in. Great. Dimitri, talk a little bit about your alumni network at Ross. So our alumni network is pretty unbelievable. Uh, just like Carly and Abby mentioned, I know they have strong alumni networks as well, but we have about 50,000 Ross alumni and about over 600,000 University of Michigan alumni all over the world. I think the Block M is one of the most recognizable logos in the world or, or something like that, right up there with the Golden Arches. Um, and it's, yeah, it's amazing. I'm an alum myself and it is just, they're alum back in Ann Arbor all the time, notwithstanding the last year and a half. And they're looking to give back both kind of programmatically as part of conferences, events, webinars, uh, sponsoring map projects, with our, which are multidisciplinary action projects, which is kind of a scap capstone project at the end of your first year where you get to, to work on a small consulting project with amazing organizations. And often those are driven by alumni sponsorship. Um, so, so these really programmatic ways that alumni love to give, give back and get involved. Uh, and then also just they're super willing to respond to emails and get on the phone with students uh, from the very beginning of their MBA journey to, to the end to kind of let them know about an industry or a company. Um, so uh, yeah, it's amazing. You know, every, every time I'm out in the Bay Area, I see a bunch of old classmates and a bunch of alumni. And, and it's funny, they all say they just hang out with Wolverines and see Black M's all over the place. Um, so yeah, the, the, the network's incredible and it's huge. It's just amazing where you can be in the world and see somebody yell and go blue to you as you walk with a, a Michigan hat down the street. Dimitri, I think you made a really important point there that I want to comment on, which is willingness. And, and Abby, I'd be willing to bet that um, you may have seen something similar in the last year. During COVID, I could not have been more proud of our Gator MBA alumni in terms of their responsiveness to students who've reached out for help, um, you know, connects within specific companies, you know, even you know, beyond the business school, as we think about our, our broader you know, university umbrellas. And I think that's, I think that might be here to stay um, because this year we, we've had, um, in the last couple of years, we've had, you know, communication come out from the Dean level at Warrington, uh, basically an all call for, you know, job and internship um, opportunities to, to be sent to our career team. And I can tell you both years in a row, we got back way more than we could even manage initially. And so I just want, I think that was really important to me through what you mentioned in terms of the alumni willingness to help. I haven't been in the higher ed business, you know, for for a decade, but I can tell you that even in the few years that I've been here, it seems that it's getting, um, you know, more and more responsive each each year. And I think that's partly due to COVID, but but I think we're going to see that excitement and, and willingness to help stay. Yeah, that's great to see. Now, uh, for people who are uh, thinking about applying in the next admission season. Uh, and they don't really know what industry they want to go into or what job, kind of job they want to have. I wonder if you could guess what percentage of your incoming cohort actually knows what they want when they enter the program. They know their discipline. They know their industry. They may even know their geography. How many, what percent do you think it would be, Carly? John, at the risk of repeating a quote that I may or may not have used in a previous panel, but let's assume mostly a unique audience. Uh, there's a Winston Churchill quote that I love that I quote at orientation every year in a lot of admissions interview, and, and that's no battle was ever won by plan, but no battle was won without one. And so we, we like for students to come in with a plan. So, you know, I'd say 
85% of the students articulate a plan in an admissions interview, which is helpful. But is your question, do they stick to that said mm -hmm. plan? Okay. Um, I'd say, let's say 50%. Because a lot of a lot of folks don't know what they don't know, right? So we right. we we love career switchers at Warrington, um, you know, ba basically bringing folks in, educating them very early on. Look, what do MBAs typically do? And so once they find out about you know a realm of possibilities outside of what they had originally thought, you know, we see a lot of deviation. Um, so that fit that fifty percent may be generous and and over calculating those or over guessing those who actually stick with what they want, but. We do have a fair number of students who know generally what they're looking for and they use our resources to, to get there. I'd be curious to know about what the other panelists uh, guess. Yeah, Dimitri, what's your guess? It, it sounds about the same here. And I think Abby made a point earlier on that, you know, this isn't a linear process. And I think that relates to so much to this question that it is not linear. Your career, business school, the application process, et cetera, is not linear. And, and kind of the sooner you embrace that as an applicant or a business school student, I think the more success you have. Uh, and John, I think I think you mentioned it right. Part of our, our goal is to get you a job, but not just any job, a job that is going to be fulfilling and a good use of your skills, talents. Uh, and, and I think that willingness to change your mind from what you declared on an application to what you end up doing uh, is is a huge factor in, in being successful and having a rewarding career. So yeah, we, we do see about 50% of people that will go after something something else. And I think that's great. Uh, so I think it's a, a testament to, to people embracing a, a mindset that change is okay. And Abby, would you say it's 50-50 or because Berkeley is so closely associated with you know, Silicon Valley and the Bay Area tech uh, companies are more people likely to to know that that's what they want to do. We definitely have a big contingent that goes into tech, but it's never been more than like 35, 40 mm percent. -hmm. And, and um, so it's, it's a chunk, but there's also a big chunk that pursue consulting and a big chunk that pursue different financial services, including FinTech. I was so glad you mentioned that earlier, Dimitri, because there's so much interest. But I, I will share a little anecdote. So we have a one of our career coaches, a guy named Mark, who's hilarious, always does this segment during orientation where he says, okay, so everybody got in, raise your hand if you had a really clear path about what you wanted to do on your application. All the hands go up, everyone's very proud. And he says, all right, now put your hand down if you still wanna do that. And even within orientation, with that one week, just meeting all the classmates, I think you know their mind is blown about what's possible. And so I would say, um, I would say, at, you know, at, at least a third of the hands go down. So probably that you know that fifty percent number is about right. And um, and and what I will add is that sometimes people come back. In fact, they often come back. This is the nonlinear part. Because there, there is a lot of thought that goes into that application. You're just at the beginning of this journey of self-discovery. You're talking to people about what they got out of business school. You have a hypothesis. You write it down. You get into a school. And then once you're there, you may, you know, waver a little bit. And to Dimitri's earlier point, you know, a lot of people come in looking at just to pick on tech for a minute, product management, marketing, finance. But what they discover is that there are these jobs in between those called business operations and strategy and customer success. And that, you know, in conversations with classmates, then club meetings, faculty, et cetera, everything grows and changes a little bit. So they, they, they stick usually with, you know, industry or function, maybe geography, but they may stray a little bit from the original plan. And that's yeah. And we know that the majority of uh, entering students who come into a two-year MBA program want to do a career transition or switch of some kind. I wonder, from your perspective, what makes uh, successful candidates doing a career switch different from those who have more trouble? Uh, is it early planning? Is it getting on track as soon as possible so that you can land the right internship that leads to a full-time job offer? What, what, what sort of tricks or advice can you provide uh, uh, an incoming student to, to increase the odds of a successful career switch? Abby? Well, we call it um, a career hypothesis for a reason. 
um, because it's really a research question. You know, this is going to sound a little academic, but it's a research question that you are testing. Um, it is important to have a hypothesis because it's 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 honestly just a matter of time, as as was mentioned earlier. It's drinking from the fire hose. You cannot possibly attend everything that's available to you on any of our campuses. So your career hypothesis has to drive you to attend the kinds of things that you're exploring. Um, it, it's also, you know, the case where sometimes somebody chases their career hypothesis and finds out either this isn't for me or it didn't work out. Um, and, you know, this particular field has completed their hiring. So it's so important to think about not only your hypothesis, which is, you know, focus, Mm -hmm. but also your plan B, like what is the plan B? And plan B is not a failure, by the way, you guys. Plan B is what's that stepping stone job or internship that's gonna give me new skills, that's gonna move me in the direction of where I think I wanna go longer term. So that would be my advice. Great, Carly, what's the phrase the most successful candidates from those who um, don't yet have a job? Three months after when you got a report to US News, they don't yet have a job. They're in that small percentage of people who aren't yet landed. What separates the two? So a couple of things that we know about successful students, it sort of summarizes a lot of what we've been talking about. Um, two characteristics, you know, grit, really being able to put in the time. And, 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 and you know, a related fact is putting in that time early because you can't make up for all that you know, at the end and expect quick results. Um, Flexibility and open mind, open mindedness, as Dimitri mentioned. So, you know, those are um, two components that have to be very consistent throughout the fall and, and spring. But I think for us, we um, are an extremely high touch uh, career services team. And so we expect students, even after onboarding, to stay very, very engaged with their coach. And I think um, making sure that the coach is really plugged into the strategy and being open and receptive to feedback uh, throughout the process when uh, things you know, didn't go as planned in the fall um, in, in a really proactive way, because certainly we're small enough that you know, we, we can go find the students who sort of um, fall off of our radar fairly easily. But um, you know, I, I think it's it, it's grit, flexibility, and then staying as engaged with us as we as we demand coming in because we accept a very small number of students each year that we think that we can um, really really help, and so it just takes that you know openness to feedback with with your coach, and and I'm sure that's uh, true of my colleagues here as well. Great, Dimitri. Uh, given your uh, interaction with students and helping get them placed at Ross you have a sense of what separates the most successful from those who are less successful? Yeah, absolutely, and I agree with everything Carly and Abby mentioned, but I, I think if I were to, to sum it up, I'd say trusting the process, the students who trust the process are successful. Uh, and, and part of trusting the process, to, to Abby's point, is having a plan B or what we call a parallel plan, pursuing two things in parallel and not putting all of your eggs in, in one basket. Um, we've also done some interesting analysis about you know, outcomes of students who have seen with us, seen the career office and how frequently they engage with us. And we see positive correlation between seeing and engaging with us more frequently mm. and employment and salary, actually increased salary for, for seeing us uh, more than a certain number of times. So trusting the process, using the support that's available, uh, not putting all of your eggs in one basket, um, all of those are associated with really positive outcomes. Yeah, that's really good advice. Uh, I, you know, we've said it here, I want to underline it. Get involved early, try to get yourself on track as soon as you can, know, know what you really want. Uh, work with all the people in the career management or career development office because they're there to help you. Uh, align with your coach and with your second year MBAs who've been through the internship process and can offer a lot of advice. And let's face it, each industry has its own way of evaluating candidates. You know, the consulting industry is famous for its so-called case interviews. Uh, and you join the consulting club, obviously, right away, because a lot of the consulting club members are going to help you uh, basically prep 
for the those types of interviews. Uh, same thing, you're going to go into finance, whatever field you're going to go into, go into that professional club. So you're going to be surrounded by people who know a lot about that industry, who've been through the mill on some level, maybe they actually came from that industry, or maybe they already had an internship. These are all really good support uh, services that are important for people. You know, one function that you guys play that is rarely discussed, but I think is incredibly valuable is helping people negotiate with a future employer. You know, we hardly ever talk about that, but some of the more interesting, I think, and encouraging and helpful roles that you play is handholding when someone is negotiating with an employer. And I'm not just talking about pay or a sign-on bonus, but more importantly, let's say you have two offers and they're both great offers and you just, you're having trouble choosing. Uh, how do you help people through a decision like that? Carly, can you give us an example without naming names or companies of someone you, you help guide through this process? I've got two great offers. Uh, I kind of like both companies and I can't decide. There's a few methods that we use. Um, some were, so I, I am also, I'm an alum of our full-time MBA program at UF. And so some of them were used on me. And so those were helpful and I've used those with other students. Um, but one of them is, you know, all things considered, um, if this were a, a coin toss, this is somewhat untraditional. Um, if this were a coin toss, you know, a sign, a sign of value, if someone has a quarter or a penny or whatever um, to a company, I still think there's some um, bias to uh, whatever the student will tell you is heads. I think lots of times that sort of underlines what they're lo really looking for. That's somewhat tactical, uh, but then flip it and see how they feel, right? Are they relieved when it was the company that they actually want? Are they, you know, sort of doubtful um, if, you know, there was a slight edge uh, for the other firm, but lots of times they're still really conflicted. And so we kind of go back to, trying to determine, especially since we have a singular coach that works with them throughout the entire process. Um, so I'll go back to some of those earlier conversations and, and, and pull out here, here were some of the things that you said were really important in a job, right? Here's some of the values that you articulated to me and we've developed and cultivated the relationship over the two years. And so I just ask a lot of questions and then try to state back and summarize how the student um, is feeling. But, you know, John, it's also really not a one size fits all scenario. I think it, it's student specific and, and Abby and Dimitri um, also work in um, offices that get to know the students really well and, and can recommend some other specific courses of action. But um, the first one is somewhat of a flippant, no pun intended uh, way of going about it, but it's somewhat um, revealing sometimes in, in, ter in terms of the way the student feels. Yeah. You know, you mentioned something that really is important and that's listening, right? Uh, and that goes back to Dimitri's comment about the more contact people have with career management and career development, uh, the more likely they are to be successful and to actually have better outcomes in terms of when they get their offer and what their offer is. And it, it, it makes sense to me if, if I'm interacting with you and, and you get to know me as an individual, you know what my values are and what I really want. And you're listening through that process. So then when I come to you and I say, I have this offer and I have that offer, uh, you have a foundation from which to draw to help guide me through that discussion with uh, the employers and with myself. Yeah, uh, Abby, can you right? And so, Abby, do you have a, a recent example where maybe you helped a student um, decide one way or another? Well, um, I will say that it's usually a little messier than we're probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> then we're probably leading you to believe. And that's only because, or at, at least as I was thinking about this, I was like, yeah, it's just, it's, it's rarely that two jobs are lined up perfectly and you have the same amount of time to decide on job A versus job B. And not that anyone was suggesting that, but I, I found myself sort of going there. Then I was thinking, no, 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 that's not the way it works. It usually is. I need a little more information. I'm really close. And, and uh, you know, I, I think I'm going to get another round with this company. So I think one of the ways career offices can be helpful. And as I'm thinking about more recent conversations I've had with students, it's, it's um, to your point, John, it's about negotiating other things, which may be time, some additional time to make a decision. If that's what you need, it may be trying to negotiate, um, you know, location, work from, it, it's a whole bunch of different things. And so 
the career teams at all of our schools can really partner with you on that. Um, so anyway, that's one thing that comes to mind. Another thing that comes to mind is there's a lot of data out there that our schools use, share. It's all, of course, anonymized, but you can get a lot of good information about what a particular job pays, um, what other um, components of a package have been successfully negotiated by peers that will really help you go to a negotiation, um, better prepared, better informed, and more likely to have a positive outcome. So that's what comes to mind for me around negotiations and, and sell. And I know at Haas, having looked at your employment reports over the years, a certain percentage of your students actually get equity, uh, even as new uh, MBA recruits. So there are things, you know, that, uh, you'd be very helpful in terms of, no, hey, you know, these students who went into this industry got this, uh, how does that match up with what you're being offered? Things like that, that could become very helpful to people. Uh, Dimitri, yeah, that's uh, right. With, yeah. Yeah. Dimitri, you have a take on this? Yeah, I, I agree again with everything Carly and Abby said, and they said, said some really, you know, I think important things about um, uh, you know, Abby, it's, it's messy, not always just kind of it this job or that job. And, and John, to your point of, you know, we know the history and that could be really helpful in going into a negotiation conversation. And, and Carly, I loved your point about a asking a lot of questions. And we do a lot of that at, at Ross as well. I think a story that comes to mind recently of a negotiation I helped the student on is they're going to a smaller company and it was an offer that was uh, you know, they're, they're thinking they might decline, not align with their long-term career goals. And through a series of questions, kind of help, help the student realize that, you know, there's an alternative to just saying no, because it's not what they wanted, but that they could say what they did want. And, uh, you know, it turns out it was a month long conversation with the company, but now they're going to a role that they're really excited about that they might've turned down otherwise. Um, and I think that's really great for the company. They've got a, an employee now who's really jazzed up about the role. They helped shape it. Um, and a student who's really excited that they have a, a, a role that aligns with their longer term career goals where they can really add value how they want to. Um, so, so those kinds of conversations are among my favorite with, with negotiation where it's, it's truly win-win. Um, it is a, a little more creative in terms of not just do I accept this or not or bump push for a little bit of a higher salary, but um, you know, you, you can't get that with every post MBA job uh, and those opportunities where it does happen often with a, a smaller company, those are really fun. True. Now, a lot of applicants study employment reports from schools. And I, I think a lot of people make a couple of critical mistakes here. And I wonder what the three of you think. I think one mistake that people commonly make about the MBA in evaluating its actual value in the ROI is they look at starting salary and sign-on bonus, and then and then they think that's the end all and be all to what uh, the ROI is going to be. It's only the start. That the greatest benefits of an MBA education come over the long haul, uh, and it's not just about starting salary and sign-on bonus. Number one. Number two, they'll assume, oh, okay, you put a lot of people in, in the consulting. A high percentage of your class goes in the consulting. That means that if I want to be a consultant. I'm better off at your school than another school that has a smaller percentage of people going into consulting. And I think that's totally untrue because in fact, at the school that's supplying fewer students in the consulting could very, very well have more opportunities for those students because there are fewer going into consulting and there's less competition. Now, talk about some of these misconceptions, these myths, uh, how someone can misinterpret an employment report uh, Carly, you want to go for that? I'd love to go first. Thanks, John. So, um, you know, folks in our line of business, I think, have lobbied, depending on the part of the country where you live in, have lobbied for purchasing power parity, um, you know, analysis to be published alongside of those reports. But, um, you know, at Florida, I think, uh, you know, really sharp applicants will ask this question, you know, why should I come to Florida when the average base is where it is compared to maybe even, you know, Ross or Haas? And the, the interesting thing about folks who come to our university is they like to stay warm. <laughs> and in, in, warm, in warm parts of the country, sometimes the cost of living is a little lower. And so as you think about you know, where you wanna be and what you wanna earn and, and what 
uh, geography, there, there's all kinds of considerations to make. And so I always encourage applicants to kind of look at um, where you want to be in terms of industry and function and, and ask the career team if you have access to them through the recruiting process, because most of our teams will entertain some of those questions um, from applicants who are uh, trying to attract within, within specific functions. And so I think we're able to provide more you know, detailed um, insights into whatever it is they want to know within bounds, of course. Um, but yeah, that, that's, I, I was laughing, John, because um, uh, when it comes to, you know, average starting salary and, and um, places in the world that have higher or lower cost of living areas that can really um, drive some of that. Although I agree with what you said. I mean, they're, they're great indicators, but I, but I think as we reflect on how focused many of our applicants are becoming these days, um, it probably makes sense if you have the opportunity to really drill into these questions through the admissions process and remember that you're a consumer. So everyone who's listening to our discussion here, um, you know, has an opportunity to interface with our teams and be critical. We, we like that. And, and, and normally as much as we can, we want to keep having these discussions. And so your questions educate us about what it is you're looking for. And so if ultimately there's a match between one of our institutions and you, we're even better situated even earlier on to have the conversation. Right. Abby, Thanks for letting me go first with that one, John. <laughs> well, you didn't have a chance to think about it. You see that? Now, Abby, you had plenty of chances to think about this one. Uh, what, how can people misinterpret the employment report and what, what should they keep in mind when they look at it? Yeah, so um, you, I know you know this, John, and of course the panelists do as well, but to all the listeners, there is actually an industry standard Mm -hmm. that is um, out there for all of our schools to follow. It's called MBA CSEA guidelines, which, was, which is, is a fabulous idea. It's a great way to sort of allow students to see whether it's salary or the percent that are joining a particular industry, somewhat of an apples to apples comparison. And to Carly's point where she wishes there were um, some way to index it with cost of living for the region that you're in, I wish there was some way to account for stock options because um, in order to, to level the playing field, which we need to, um, there are just a few things that are, that are included in compensation. So stock options aren't one of them, um, but it's, a, it's I think 45% of our grads do tend to get stock options and you don't see that on the employment report. So to Carly's point, dig deeper. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Dimitri, you have a perspective on this? Yeah, I think y'all have mentioned some fantastic things that are worth keeping in mind. And, and just a couple others that come to my mind is, is one, just how frequently people change jobs these days and, and how kind of within a few years post business school, you know, you're, you're in a new job and a new organization with a new salary. Um, and and the, the employment report doesn't capture that. I think looking at LinkedIn, you know, looking in the industries and the companies and the roles of alumni uh, is a, a really nice way to one, see their own kind of that, that profile of where people have gone, but also just to, to check out where that alumni base is now in a way that may not be captured uh, in a employment report about where they end up immediately post-graduation. Okay, that's great. We only have a couple of minutes, but I wanna play a game. I wanna to pretend to be uh, an MBA admit who's just been admitted into your program and I know what I want and I don't want anything else. I don't want a plan B, Abby, I'm sorry. I want to be a product manager at Apple. I come into your office and that's what I tell you. What do you tell me? <laughs> so Abby, did you Sorry, hear? Is this, what is you this a question me? for me? Yeah, oh, I'm okay. into your office. I'm telling you, I want this MBA because I want to be a product manager at Apple. I don't want to work anywhere else. I don't want to have any other role. What do you tell me? Well, I start by asking a lot of questions. Um, and before I dive into those questions, I affirm your choice of business schools because we are um, just about an hour away from Apple with lots of alums that are working there. And the questions begin because I, I wanna just assess your, your grit, a uh, great word that um, Carly used earlier yeah. and your career readiness to really go for it. It's a competitive job and, and it can be done. So uh, we'll work together to support Great. Dimitri, same answer? 
I, I would do this, the same thing as Abby. I'd ask you a lot of questions, getting at why, what is it about the role that appeals to you? Uh, you know, get an understanding of, of kind of what strengths you have at play, where your gaps might be, how we might fill those gaps over the next couple of years. Um, you know, start to think about if that's not your first job post MBA, what's another job that might be a, a good stepping stone to get you there? If that's a long term career aspiration. Um, yeah, those, those are some of the things we would talk about in that first meeting. Great. And I know, Carly, the first question you're going to ask is, do you think you have the grit to do that? <laughs> well, you've, you've taken as a constant that they're not going to change their mind. Um, so the only thing I would add is, let me connect you with every Gator I know who's in a job like that and um, have you ask them how they got there. Because sometimes it's not the first MBA role. Sometimes it is and that'd be great, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's not. And so um, some firms, you know, start, well, this student is stuck on Apple. And, and so that it is possible immediately, you know, after the MBA, but as much as we can, um, especially once your resume is ready to go and you're sort of trained up on informational interviews, I'm going to unleash you into the wild and make a bunch of connections for you, show you how to make your own connections so that you have a really clear narrative and a lot of data to support, you know, how those folks got into those roles and understand, you know, with your skill set, which is the path that um, is more likely for you to follow. Terrific. Okay. You know what? I feel good about this. I think I could, I could do this. I could go and be a product manager at Apple now. I really can. Hey, uh, everyone out there, hey, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you so much for participating, Carly, Dimitri, and Abby. I want to remind everyone, and we do have a bunch of questions um, that piled up from Juan and Ravi and a few other people, uh, that we have info sessions now, and you can ask those questions directly. Because uh, I didn't want to uh, do a Q&A here, since we do have the info session. So uh, go to the landing page. Uh, click on the breakout room that you want and shoot away. Abby and Dimitri and Carly are happy to answer any questions you might have. Meantime, stay safe and healthy. And uh, once again, Abby, thank you so much on behalf of Poets and Quads. Dimitri, uh, same story over at Ross and Carly, a pleasure to see you at Florida. Thank you so much. This is John Byrne at Poets and Quads.